set up a zoom call with your past client ask them if they don't mind if you record it set up a call with the people on your team like coach them like this capture it like this you see what i'm saying <laughs> Good morning, Chris. What's up, Joe? How you doing? Good, buddy. I feel like I'm good. at an office meeting. I'm excited. Yeah, it feels good to feels good to have you here. Taylor and I were just talking. I brag about friendship probably more than most friendships I've ever bragged about. Like we've been collaborating together for Taylor and I. We figure we hired curator in 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, we've taken a lot of your advice. Our agents think that there's smart things that come from me because I've r and your stuff so much, but the reality is I'm just, I'm just uh, regurgitating Chris Smithisms all over the place. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Happy to help. <laughs> so talk to us a little bit about the conversion code, what it's done. I know you've written a couple of books, but for some reason, the conversion code really resonated across the industry. And I think it's even crossed into other industries. I know Initially, you probably wrote it for the for guys like myself in the real estate business, but you're teaching classes at universities on it. I mean, it's really become like, to some degree, a, a Bible for for salesmanship. Um, so talk a little bit about why you wrote the conversion code one, what it's done, and then lead into conversion code two. Yeah, what, what you just made me think of there is when I do have a chance to do like a three hour workshop or a one hour keynote, I, I almost always have this moment about halfway through and people are taking notes and they're, you know, they're learning and it's this fire hose and it, you know, I pride myself on sort of new original ideas, which are, are sort of just hard to find. And I'll get a, about halfway through and it always just feels right to say, hey, does anybody feel like somebody should write a whole book about this stuff? And they're like, yes. And it's like, Hey, that's mine. The conversion code, you know, go down. <laughs> the and it. So it, it, they're like, everybody said, Oh, so much has changed technology, the internet, social media, digital marketing, inside sales, lead conversion, CRM, SMS. It's a lot. So, what I did, Joe, is actually one time I, I just grabbed like a pen and paper. I'm always kind of, um, you know, every call I have, I'm doing some version of that, right? <laughs> so I, I got a pen and paper and I just sort of wrote out with acronyms all the different components involved of what I had built at the time, which was, you know, I was several steps ahead of most people. Um, and it was just so much that my brain just worked left to right. So I think the reason colleges, universities, to your question, are you know embracing it uh, is because it is written much more like a textbook than a traditional business book. I, I would call it more of a readable textbook than a business book with a lot of takeaways, because the the chapters are literally website, email, retargeting, TikTok, Instagram. Like it, it's probably the closest thing to a digital marketing plus inside sales textbook that's ever been written. And so that's why you're saying, oh, we, we quote your stuff. We use your stuff because I, I've sort of have my own little, little lane, like with lead conversion. Um, I don't really think people were even using that term for a long time. It, you know, it was lead generation. Nobody talked about the pain point. So I wrote the book to address that, but I learned that part of business first, which was really a blessing. Like if you start as an ISA and then you progress up and then let's say you end up being a buyer's agent and the ISA is booking appointments for you, you know, don't you think you'll appreciate that way more <laughs> if you actually used to have to book those appointments? Uh, so that's one of those things. And even think about if you're a listing agent and now somebody's showing homes for you and you don't have to go show homes, you appreciate it because you did it. You appreciate right. not doing the open house because you did the open house. You right. appreciate not having like floor duty and work in the front <laughs> desk, you know, because you did it and you sort of like leveled up. So anyway, um, I just think of lead conversion is a fun topic. It's an interesting topic. And uh, I, I love it. So it's fun to teach it at colleges. It's fun to teach it at conferences and, and on calls like this. So I hope we can dig in. 
So talk talk about what's changed. So uh, conversion code one um, was written in 2016. When did you write that? Yeah, 2016 March is when it came out. Good good guess. Look at that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not Cheers. guess; it's knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about what's changed because because uh, lead generation has changed. Mm-hmm. Um, you talk a lot about stop chasing leads, you know, so, I mean, that was always somewhat of your message was there's just mm-hmm. a smarter way to do this. But then now with the, I mean, social media existed back then, but now there's this whole economy of influencer marketing and all this fun stuff. Mm-hmm. So talk about, you, you know, one of the things you highlighted when we were in Orlando a couple of weeks ago is just now my phone will tell me straight up, I mm-hmm. don't answer numbers. I don't know. And not mm-hmm. only that, but my phone will tell me this is probably spam. And that's yeah. new. That's new since 2016. Yeah. Well, you know what? It's funny. I, one of the other things that we talked about in Orlando a lot was TikTok. And so the, the I actually put a video up about that kind of practicing what I preach here. And it's got 55,000 views overnight. And the people that are commenting on that idea that 90% of people don't answer the phone anymore for the reasons you just mentioned, it, it you know, the spam gets identified. They're even telling me in the comments on TikTok, like, hey, you can go in the settings and you can silence all from anything outside of your contact list. So you see what I'm saying? That's what's yeah. changed is yeah. that the, the, those filters are there and they're getting thicker. So email marketing is not immune. You know, text message marketing, as you know, you're the king of Facebook ads. You obviously took a huge blow when HUD and Facebook had their falling out. So right. if you look at like the changes in ad targeting, if you look at these pop-ups that say, can we track you? Will you accept cookies? By the way, breaking news, everyone says no, virtually, <laughs> right? So that's changed. That was, None of these things existed. And then I would also throw in there, I just read the audio book in the last four, four out of five days. So one thing I remember saying when I just read it was that arguably the biggest change between the first book and the second book is TikTok. And it really is like, think of a, a massive social network with tons and tons of users that literally didn't even exist. It was called Musical.ly. It, no one was using it. And if they were, it was, you know, the fringe case, super early kind of tween right. usage. And, but what they unlocked is kind of what stories was starting to unlock Joe, which was like short vertical stuff is better for a phone. People are going to be on the phone so often that they're not going to want to even turn it sideways. So, you know, the, the vertical videos and them also being short, it was just like a perfect storm for like the right kind of content for the right generation. I'll give you an example that's top of mind with me right now. Have you been watching the Johnny Depp, uh, Amber Heard yeah. trial? Yep. Okay. Well, Where have I mean, I see it, it on, Where I have see you it been on watching social. It? Yeah. I see it on social. Yeah. So you're not watching the live stream. You're not watching the full replay of the court proceedings because you might fall asleep. You're watching the highlights and the funniest parts on TikTok, on Reels, right? Yep. So th- what I'm arguing is that that is a pretty inarguable change that happened. And whether it's shorts, reels, TikTok, stories, like get into it. One like simple thing people can do is if you're getting pictures taken of a listing or videos, have the videographer shoot the listing vertically and shoot the videos vertically. And make that sort of a standard operating procedure when they give you back the assets, when you hire them and you may have to pay a little more. You know, when I, I think about it this way, Joe, if I've got a video that I want to use to promote something, book, listing, whatever it is, if the only thing I've got is a traditional three minute horizontal video, the best places I can put that are YouTube and probably Facebook. Those are sort of like the, Mm -hmm. the right format for that. So you're telling me I can't put it on reels that has the most reach. I can't put it on TikTok, which has the most reach. I can't put it in stories, which people love. Like, I I can't even imagine getting a video produced ever again, where in the kit they send back to you, there's not the vertical version, the 30 second version, the 15 second version. And I just did this with my launch and I paid more. You should see the folder. 
60 second, 30 second, 15 second, six second, because that matches up with all the ad units. And then horizontal, vertical, horizontal, vertical. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's crazy, but that change is really big. Like right now, sort of breaking the fourth wall. I also now, every podcast, every interview or class I teach like this, I've got a vertical Canon ADD with its own road mic, and I'm going to get that footage because it's vertical. There'll be little snippy stuff that we talked about. And, and you see that all the time as well on reels on TikTok. that Glenda Baker style is very real. I looked at yeah. Veronica's account. I looked at my account. I looked at Byron's account. I looked at all these people's accounts and that format is super popular. The reason is because I'm not worried about it. When you ask me questions, when we go back and forth like that, when I can see these people across the top of the zoom tuning in live, it's a different like energy than if it's just me and the camera, you know, Hey, today's <laughs> tip is about this, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I think that this is like a, a staying power format that actually makes everybody a little bit better at video because right. it just lets them stay right here, but capture it here. You throw captions on it. You get rid of some of the dead space. It's killing it for me. Well, so where are you at on the topic? I, I talk about this a lot. Gary V talks about documentation over creation. So mm -hmm. how much of the content that you create is a documentation of something that's happening in your world, something that you're passionate about yet versus like scripting and mm -hmm. like, where do you think the, cause, cause again, this is all about the audience receipt, right? It's all about who is going to receive this and why would they view it, like it, share it, whatever. So where are you at on the documentation over creation argument? Yeah, my goal and the reality I'm trying to build for myself would be that the traditional, you know, keep a list of ideas, set up the camera occasionally to record those. Like I, I, I want that part of my content creation career to be done with between workshops, Zoom calls, client coaching calls, like, I, I feel like I can, I think now you can get the document and the output can be huge because to, to film stuff where it's like two a day, every day, like, which is really hard to keep up with, but that's what everyone says you should do <laughs> to do that. You really have to get a bunch of ideas and then you have to dedicate a big chunk of time and then go film a ton of them. Well, if I actually just shift to document, which is what this camera's doing, right? Now, this call 30, 45 minutes, 60 minutes, right? So that is the, the same concept as batching. So what I would recommend people do, and I'm even just thinking about this as we talk through it, you may not be in a position where you're getting interviewed so often like an author where you're actually getting that much footage to use, but create that reality set up a zoom call with your past client, ask them if they don't mind, if you record it, set up a call with the people on your team, like coach them like this, capture it like this. You see what I'm saying? You can right. actually get that baked in almost no matter who you are, you know, do a call with your lender, do a call with you. Right. But anyway, yeah, I, I think that is something everybody can start doing Joe right away. And they should, um, it's not that hard to do. It's, it's sort of get a human in front of you with Glenda Baker. She's sitting at a table and the guy's right there. I saw a video. She had put a video up about this. I think today she said, I just couldn't look at nobody. I couldn't not look at the camera. It was all right. So right. she's like, they started and gave her an empty chair. And they're <laughs> like, well, just look at the chair Pretend someone's in the chair. And then eventually she just grabbed someone in the room. Like, can you just sit there for a second and right. then let's try this? So I, I just think that's a huge unlock and I'm excited by it because, and you meet people all the time. Think about it. Excellence. Think about, uh, you know, a real mastermind. You're standing around talking with people that are brilliant. And in that hallway, real world setting, it comes across how many of them, as soon as they hit record on a camera, that almost all goes out the window, right? right? So I think that's actually a really big opportunity for people that have the chops, but for whatever reason, it didn't translate to the lens. Um, 
Yes. Well, and that's kind of the Talladega Nights thing, right? Like, what do I do with my hands? Because there is still some meritocracy to this. Like, you, you're very well spoken, good looking mm-hmm. guy. So it's like people will Thank tune you. in and, and see you. Yeah. So I, I think there is still merit behind it. You look at Veronica, you look at Glenda Baker, you look at Amy Youngren, you look at Spring mm-hmm. Benson, you look at some of these people and you're like, well, naturally people see it and go like, well, what does she have to say? Or what does he have to say? Right. So, yes. but I think there's so much power in what you're saying, mm-hmm. which is like, I remember when this thing first hit, I, I saw Donald Trump do a Facebook live and I was like, bro, you're running for president. And mm-hmm. there was no pre, there was no post. There was like a guy with a phone. Mm-hmm. And so I started going like, uh, I would pick up a lockbox and mm-hmm. I was to go on Facebook live and I'm like, Hey guys, did you know we use the best lockboxes, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And I was just all committed to that documentation of like what it's like to be a real estate professional. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think, think, talk about this, Chris, because one of the obstacles we run in is Number one, we create content for our peers, which I think is is a mistake as far as like if I if if I'm a real estate agent and I'm running a client centric video and all of the accolades I get are from other real estate professionals, I probably have have missed the mark. And then number two, we work off of the assumption that all of our clients know what our world looks like, where there is so much interest, I think, for for our consumers to go like how does stupid things like a lockbox work? Who shoots your videos? You know, like taking a video of yourself and saying like, guys, did you know that my videographer, here he is, blah, yeah. blah. Like people love that type of content. So talk about that, that well, obsession with real estate fame mm-hmm. with other realtors and then mm-hmm. failure to document like the world that we actually live in. Yeah, so that's a big question. But what, what I want to tackle is the idea that the behind the scenes content is what people want. I agree okay. that some people, that's what they want. A lot of people, it's an insanely popular category. HGTV, like we get it. But the issue is what if that's not what you want to create? That's exactly where the problem happens. So while that may be kind of popular and proven to work, if the person creating it doesn't really want to, it, it's never going to stick. You know, if you're, if you're doing it because that's what you're supposed to do, like it just won't stick. So when I was working with Veronica recently and I had a conversation with her about LinkedIn and Twitter specifically, because she was on stage at Inman and I'm like, wow, that's amazing. And obviously that's a CEO VP kind of a LinkedIn crowd. And you know, her profile picture was missing from LinkedIn uh, she had only really shared anything she had been tagged in, kind of a reshare. And then on Twitter, it wasn't as bad, but also it was sort of, you know, same thing, only retweeting other people's stuff, never any original content on either platform, which are pretty major places to be. If your goal is to be an influencer, if your goal is to be a thought leader, and that was, that was and is her goal. So like, do I go back to her team, Joe, and say, we got to get Veronica using LinkedIn more. Do, you, do If anybody thinks that's the strategy and next step, that's where people miss. Because what you have to do is let the talent be the talent. You have to let people, and for yourself, you have to do what you love doing that you do naturally. So let's say, and a lot of people on this call, Joe, you know this, Facebook and their profile is really like where they share the most, where they go the deepest, where they have the most back and forths. So I just think that like, if you look at sort of what is that, uh, what is that place you can start that you already use? And then what can you do like operation? What can you pull out of there for these other places? Some people are really consistent with a blog. Not very many though. Some people are really (laughs) good at sending emails. Some people are really prolific on updating on Instagram, on stories, on Twitter, on LinkedIn. So all I'm saying is Veronica's team's job was what is she already putting out and creating and what can we document that she's already doing that's right for LinkedIn. And so it's about you know what she doesn't about, want to share the behind the scenes day in a life of a realtor stuff. You know what I mean? So, yeah. so it's, that's what it's about. It's, it's about like, 
if you don't have the time, but you have the team, they need to sort of work behind you and you need to do the thing that you love to do the most, you know, anyway, I know it's a little bit of a tricky concept, but. Well, it's, it's about, it's, it's about leaning into your superpower as opposed to try to tackle your weakness, right? Like we, yeah. Taylor and I discovered that years ago. He was like, I don't want to do this. And I'm like, well, I don't want to do that. We naturally kind of decided we like different things. And so we leaned into them and we've had massive success from it. So really quick in the chat, if you guys could do me a favor, drop in your preferred. If you had to say my social media superpower is, yeah, is it you, TikTok? Yeah. Is it Insta? Is it Facebook? Like, where do you guys find? Cause I'll tell you, Chris, I'm like, I have not been on LinkedIn in two years. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't mess with it at all. Mm-hmm. Um, talk about this concept, because I want to see where people are at. YouTube is awesome. Instagram. Um, you, one of the things you said in Orlando recently that really resonated with me, because we've been such a call-centric team. Yeah. But one of the things, you, you know, it's almost like for us, we, we force the call because we're afraid to pivot into texting and, and DMs and things like that. What are you seeing in the, in the economy as far as, uh, and give Chris a, a follow as well. For those of well, you- Well, everybody said team. Insta. So I'm like, man, let me drop the Insta, right? <laughs> when they all said they love it. Cause that's, that's sort of my, one of my preferred hubs. It's weird for me. I have two Joe, which is like, you know, I really love Instagram and I really love Twitter. And so, yeah. you know, the two of those are the ones where there's going to always be stuff coming out. You know, yeah. and uh, some of the tweets make great Instagram. Some of the tweets yeah. get, you know, going deeper make a great LinkedIn post. Um, well, so talk, talk about this concept, though, of, of moving to the like 90 percent of people won't answer the phone. Right. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. then rather than forcing the, the like fishing for the 10 yep. percent, there is the text text message DM world. Like if you were in these like our agents who are watching this live listening to the podcast whatever Mm -hmm. what are you what are you teaching and preaching as opposed Mm -hmm. as far as like contacting potential clients in 2022 well i'll give you a good analogy and i just thought of this if you think about facebook as a social network and you think about next door as a social network the fact that next door is you know, it could be about crime in your neighborhood. It, it, it's, you know, it's your street, right? And so it's, it's a different vibe in there. Does that make sense? Like what you would yeah. post and what people do in there is really different. So I think that that sort of same difference exists with email list to text message list. So there's an app that I use called community. And the reason they named it that it's community.com for people that want to check it out. The reason they named it that is because it really should be your inner circle. It should be your biggest fans. It should be the people that like you the most, the people that want the promo code, the people that want the VIP past client event invite to the thing the the want to know about the movie night in the park that want to know about, you know, the, you know, once a year, that want to know about the accolade you got. You see what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. so with, with community, uh, it's sort of a double or triple, triple kind of an opt-in, Joe. The people are basically putting you in their address book at, You know when they uh, text something or join. And then you now have these little groups and these little subgroups that they call communities that you can SMS and the, the, the data is through the charts but I think you have to treat it with like a niche focus. Like one of the things I thought about Joe, I actually thought of you with the idea of like daily deals, right. Or Mm -hmm. like, I think if people, if people would want like a list of foreclosures once a week, some people would want that. Some people would want daily deals, right? Some people would want uh, Avalon park, you know, festivals and event information see what i'm saying Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the biggest opportunity which you're mentioning is like if you can get text right you don't need the phone as much and and i think you know you think of normally phone or email and text is kind of in between but text has always been kind of this one-to-one thing if you can figure out how to scale text properly with something like community 
it could be like one of these really first mover advantages like a Facebook group was, you know, like kind of being the, uh, the expert on next door, you know, has been for a lot yeah. of people like having the most Yelp reviews was right. Like there's typically a first mover advantage. Um, when it comes to the actual phone though, I just think everybody should ask themselves, what have I done that would cause the phone to ring? Have I earned a call? Look at your marketing, look at your feed, look at your output. Is what you're putting out something that would attract someone to wanting to work with you? And that largely happens in many cases through videos or through longer form written content. So it's sort of like you got to have the reel and the TikTok, but if you don't actually have the 10 minute end up in depth, you know, kind of YouTube thing too, if you don't have the longer form, well written out thing too, you can't really establish your true expertise. So the bite size stuff is for the outer circle, you know, the people that don't really know you yet, and, and you want them to sort of enjoy it and be attracted. But then the stuff that turns the corner that shows that you're an expert at what you do for the people that are actually way more in need of your actual services, that that's a big part of this. So, so what know, it, all I'm getting at is it's challenging because you have to go deep and you have to go wide. And that's right. where I think most people kind of just say, screw this, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so walk me through a use case. So mm -hmm. we, we generate for our agents warm leads where people are like, hey, you know, I saw a house on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. Can you tell me more about it? These aren't forced reg. These are like somebody at our office is like, hey, what's your phone number? I'll have, you know, Brandon reach out or whatever. Sure. Brandon may call that guy a hundred times and he never picks up. Like what, what would be a good ratio uh, of, of call to text to, you know, we call them bait texts with, Hey, I don't know if you're interested in this property, but here's some additional photos, whatever. What would be, because we've preached for so long, the importance of a, of, of a verbal conversation, yeah. but where the numbers are just getting ridiculous with mm -hmm. do not calls and <laughs> things like that. Like what, What's yeah. your strategy around that now? Well, what we were just talking about is obviously a piece of it, which is, you know, being good at text messaging, right? It's almost like, I think we're all kind of ready if they answer, but then right. when we go into text, it's probably not as much strategy or thoughtfulness. You're saying you guys are using some strategy, uh, which is great. Part of it is perspective in that scenario you know, if somebody's ignored your calls 30 times, 50 times, they never reply to your text, like, I'm okay, not chasing, you know, putting them into more of a nurture type of a campaign, and then right. maybe revisiting going after them if they show any intent. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to saying, hey, you should show some intent. Here's some stuff, <laughs> right? I'm yeah. going to say, here's some awesome stuff. If you show intent, then I have time to kind of circle back with you. Right. So, and that's really, you know, the idea of like an outbound telemarketer dial for dollars, pound the phones, you know, that is the mindset, but you do that targeting inbound high quality leads that have been active recently. I call that behavior-based follow-up. And what I've done that's really helpful, Joe, for people is you say, okay, hey, sales team, you decide what makes like a lead worth calling. You tell me if a lead does blank and blank and blank, is that lead worth your time? I want you to say yes before I put them on a list I'm going to give you to reach out to. So if you go through that conversation, you say, hey, if a lead is more than six months old, and hasn't been on the website for a month, but then comes back and looks at five or more homes, is that a lead that you feel like you should probably call? Cool, yeah. there's one list. Let's do another one, right? If we send a mass email, which we do every week, right? Mm -hmm. And the people that click visit a contact reviews or about page while they're there, would you call them? Sure. 
You know, I ain't trying to get them to call the whole email list, Joe. I'm not even trying to get them to call the people that open it. But if you say, hey, we're going to send an email tomorrow, the subject line is going to say, selling your Vegas home soon. Would you guys agree <laughs> that we should call the people that open that? Yeah, <laughs> fuck yeah. Okay. <laughs> See what I'm saying? You have to basically get the buy-in from the person dialing. And now it's like, okay, cool. He's good or she's good. And now you go to marketing and you say, listen, I need people to do this stuff. Right. 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 <laughs> and they can, they can engineer it. And, you know, it's funny because 85% of marketers and salespeople, they say the number one opportunity for growth right now is that alignment across culture, communication, messaging systems, like that baton and that sort of camaraderie between divisions is critical. And it's so different, Joe. I spend day one with a sales team. There's 22 salespeople. Salespeople are different. The next day, there's like three marketing people. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's a different person. It's a different energy. It's a different vibe. It's a different job. And so you need somebody that's willing to say, hey, guys, I need to talk to both of you. You right. got to get along you got to overlap in ways that you both agree help the business that will go so far well so talk about this because i don't remember if it was you or phil in orlando said that uh the visionary integrator world right now for every for every for every integrator there's like four visionaries so there is a skill set where somebody loves being an integrator loves diving deep loves an, an al data analysis loves those things mm -hmm. um but there's this challenge with everybody wants to be a salesperson, right? That needs to be your next book. Everybody wants to be a salesman. So like yeah. what advice do you give somebody who's just like, man, sales just are not my gig. How do they find their world? How do they find their niche in the real estate world when they're like, I'm just not a great salesperson, but it seems like based on that statistic, there is so much value in somebody being an integrator. Well, let me role play that with you for a moment. So you're say you're saying they're not great at sales. So what would they be great at instead? Well, so my father-in-law is a prime example. I love him. Larry's the greatest guy in the world. Everybody that knows my father-in-law loves him. He was the Wrigley's gum sales rep in, in Southern Utah, Nevada, and California for like 35 years. The greatest. Mm -hmm. He said, I want to get my real estate license. This is 15 years ago. And he retired from Wrigley's and said, I want to be a realtor. So we brought him in and he really struggled with sales. And mm -hmm. I couldn't, I couldn't understand it because everybody loves him. And it was at that moment that I realized that having a personality that everybody loves and mm -hmm. being a conversion code master are two different mm -hmm. things. And that there's, there's integration people, there's customer service people who almost, I don't want to say masquerade in a negative way, but almost masquerade as salespeople, but they're actually customer service individuals. They're actually mm -hmm. data, like data analyst, analyst special, specialists. They're also, they're actually like people who are, are much better at integrating mm -hmm. and, and carrying out plans than they are at getting someone on the phone and, and converting them. Yeah. The good news is they don't need to be in sales and they should probably stay away from it. And I understand the appeal for many people, especially on the income side, but right. the reality is it's, it's certainly not for everyone. And even the people that think it's for them, 95% of them fail. So right. it's hard. It, you know, it's hard to be really good. You know, it's kind of like being an athlete. It's hard to be an athlete that actually is a pro and actually <laughs> has a huge contract. You know, it's right. actually probably similarly hard in some ways to actually be a salesperson that actually makes a ton of money. It's very rare. Um, and not everybody has that skill set. So my first thought would be, you know, what skills do they have? He obviously has the gift of gap. What I think right. his problem is just hearing you, you know, tell the quick story is it's kind of like the camera issue, Joe. It's hit when he has to sell something switches just like when somebody turns on that light that red light starts it's like uh uh you know they yeah. kind of freeze up 
that's probably what was happening for him. Because if you have that natural conversational style, then you can be great at sales. But I'll tell you what I would do if, if you said he has to stay in sales. We don't have another role for him. He's, he's going to be homeless if he doesn't <laughs> figure this out. Right. What you would do for somebody like him is you would come up with what questions he can ask people to learn about their situation because that's what he probably leans more towards. How are the kids? How's the wife? How's everybody been? How's business been? How, right? How, like, that's what, you know, a natural, you know, kind of chatterbox likes to do. And so if that's what he's doing, he is selling, you know what I mean? So I, yeah. I remember we interviewed a guy named Sean Moore on the water cooler, you know, pretty early days. And he, he basically had hit me up and he's like, Hey, Chris, like, I don't even use a listing presentation. I just ask people 15 questions and every single time at the end of it, they hire me. <laughs> and I was right. like, okay, let's get them on and figure out what those are. And so I think, you know, somebody like that, what you're trying to get him, Joe, is off the page. <laughs> right, right. Right. He's, he's, a, he's good at improv. He's not good with a script. See what I'm saying? So you can't yeah. give him a script. So if the question is sort of tell me about your situation, why are you guys, you know, doing it, uh, wanting to sell your home right now, short and sweet, and then listening, listening, listening. And then that's, right. that's him. Right. And then he gets to be himself for like 80% of it. And then it's like, okay, oh shit, I got another question. I got to ask, hold on. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can almost have fun with the fact that you're bad at it. You know what I mean? Right. Right. And, it's, and I don't want to throw Jimmy under the bus here. You know, we have that relationship where it's okay <laughs> to do so. But I told Jimmy one time, you're way better with notes than without notes. Like when he, when Jimmy like prepares and he does his homework and he puts together notes, he loves to print them out. He loves to have them in front of him as he interviews somebody. He, you know, and I listen, I'm doing exactly the same thing. So it's, it's, yeah. I get it why he does it. And I told him, I'm like, you know, you might as well just bring your notes on stage when you speak. There's no rules that you can't have a little right. bundle of notes sitting on the table instead of a laptop. And it was funny because Mark Davison came to our event. He comes up on stage. He had a beautiful deck and he had like five or six pages. He types out his speech and he, you know, didn't read it, but yeah, yeah. he also didn't miss any of the big points he wanted to make. Right. Because he had it and he was confident enough to have it there and not be like, oh, shit, I got to check my notes. Hold on. You know what I mean? It was yeah. like so it was so normal for him. And so anyway, my point would be it's OK to have the notes in front of you. It's OK to right. print them out and bring them on stage with you. You know, that kind of not knowing it verbatim for some people makes them feel empowered. But having those notes for some people you know, makes them feel empowered. I know for me, at least for the first year at Quicken Loans, I w walked in every morning, Joe, and I went straight to the little thing at the end of the cubicles with the scripts in it. And I grabbed five or six of them. And I had them in front of me on every call. And at the point that the person answered, you put their name in and then you're kind of going like, yeah. I don't know. I wasn't smarter, smart enough to not need that. Now right. you can just give me a few acronyms and I'm like, okay, I can walk you through the call, well, but it takes a lot of work to get there. What's funny um, is I, I, I went through Phil's book and I created this mm -hmm. for our team. And now on some of our calls, like if I'm on an agent attraction call or if our agents are, are working on a client, we, we kind of run a little game. Like how many of these can you get in? And like, so I'll walk around my office and I'll listen to people like, you know, could it be possible that blah, 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 or imagine if blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, or help me understand, or this may not be for you, but yeah. and they're using all these phrases and it's like, well, how many did you get in? So talk about this. We got a few minutes left. Um, sure. Inherent trait versus learned trait. Mm -hmm. Salespeople, can you learn like, can someone who naturally is not good, because there's people who, like, you're just naturally a good salesman. You've trained yourself, you've practiced your craft, you've honed your skills, but naturally you're a good salesman. Mm -hmm. There is hope 
for people who may not naturally be good salespeople that they can learn the trait. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thing that's so funny about Quicken Loans is there's 3,000 salespeople at the time I was there. So, you know, obviously so much data amongst everybody. And even just in my uh, division in Cleveland, Ohio, there was like almost 400 people. And the, the you're right, first of all, I, w- I don't want to be the one that says that it doesn't help to sort of be a natural. Right. It does. <laughs> so I'm not the one that's going to say, oh, <laughs> anyone can do it. I think anyone can do it that wants to do it and that puts in the work to do it. I do believe anyone can do it if they really put in the work. Some people will need to put in a lot more work. What I needed to do was take my natural skills and sort of put some science into that. Like, kind of like, sometimes you can be so naturally good at talking that you're not good at sales. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And, and a lot of people fall into that bucket. So when you have a framework to follow that you can't sort of screw up, you don't forget to like ask all the qualifying questions. Right, you know, right, right. Like pull their credit. Like, you know what I mean? Like you can't forget those steps in a real call. Um, I don't know if that answers answers your question no i think it does on the wrong path there no i think it's i think it's intelligent to say um any anyone can learn sales but the roadmap is a lot longer you made me me remember what i was going to say so if you looked at the top 10 out of 3000 or out of you know 300 locally 70%, 80% 70%, 80% of the top 10, as soon as the call ends and you sort of stand up, like you shoot the shit with them. You know what I mean? Like they're, yeah, just, yeah, yeah, they're yeah. just who they are. But two or three of the top 10 were these, you know, introverts who sort of hung up the headset and just sort of like went to lunch, came back, sat back down and didn't socialize once. Yeah. And the number one salesperson every single time was named Dominic Pelletieri. And they used to send pictures of his commission checks around by email. So people could (laughs) see how much money he was making. And like, he would sit there and I remember Joe, he would sit there at his desk and he would rock a little bit, but he had this really freaking laid back, cool demeanor. He, He did not sound like a salesperson at all. There was another guy on my team named Matt McLucky. He was also like more of like, you picture a more being in like a ska band than being like a sales guy. <laughs> but he was like a numbers guy. And that was one of the things I wrote down earlier. If you're not good at sales, but you're good at math, that helps too in real estate. Mm. So breaking yeah, yeah. down numbers and really understanding that profit sheets and working with investors, like a lot of them, they don't want to be emotional on that end of it. They want like, show me the numbers and then I'll put it in the offer. So anyway, um, I thought about that because Dominic was not the kind of guy that anybody would say, oh, he must be number one. But you know what? He had a great tone. So I think people should work on that. I think you need to sound trustworthy and awesome on the phone. That is important because when you do get past those brick walls up front and you end up in a longer conversation, the tone is sort of a big part of helping build a rapport. He also had the most focus. So he didn't ever leave his desk. (laughs) He wasn't taking cigarette breaks. He wasn't (laughs) eating at the food court. He was eating at his desk. He wasn't socializing in between. He wasn't going and grabbing a Red Bull and throwing a popcorn in the microwave. You see what I'm saying? He, his output was also number one. So he had skill, he had tone, he had focus and he had effort. And you know what? Some of us just wanted to kind of like take a little break after we fucking wrote a huge loan and made a shitload of money. And we like, didn't want to work hard the rest of the day. Sorry, Dominic, right. that you're over there still <laughs> dialing, but we're going yeah. to have a beer. You know what I mean? And like that, but that's okay. So all I'm saying is, even if you may start out with a little less skill, you can level it up and it's incredibly easy to outwork people. 
to outfocus people, you know what I mean? To be more yeah. disciplined. And that can make up maybe for, you know, what, what you would call not having a natural talent. But Joe, I've met too many people at too many sales organizations that are large, that are at the top, that aren't Neil the deal. Right. That aren't Chris Smith, that aren't Joe, that aren't Taylor, that aren't Phil, that aren't Veronica. Like, so I 1000% believe people can learn sales. I love it. Well, Chris, Leilani, if you could drop in the chat a link to Chris's book, it's on Amazon. It's for sale, the conversion code to, well, yes. is it, and uh, follow Chris Smith. If you are in the sales game or you lead people who are in the sales game and you do not read his book, I honestly question your sanity. Like <laughs> he is so much of what Taylor and I teach and preach comes from Chris. He authored the, I think, for, especially for, for us in our day, this, his new, the new version of his book just sheds so much light on the things that those of us who have been in the game for a long time are struggling with, mm -hmm. which is like, what, how do we handle this now? Because the game has changed. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love so much about Chris's willingness to hop back in and go like, all right, guys, some of the stuff applies. Some of the stuff has changed. Here's yeah. how you execute on these different strategies. Mm -hmm. So if you're in the sales game and you're not following Chris, if you're in the sales game and you're not reading this book, I think you're crazy. Awesome. Thanks, buddy. I put my uh, number in the chat there too for the community app. If people want to get on the SMS list, uh, and what, what I would advise is not even for self selfish reasons here, observe, observe how I use it, observe the frequency that I send something, observe what I send because Joe, I'm like walking on neat glass. Like I'm like, I respect that medium and that access to get into somebody's text like so much that I'm just sort of like being super smart and, and going really slow because I don't want to mess it up. I, I, I really believe it's one of those sort of fundamental changes that if you get right, it's huge for a really long time. Um, and this is the app, right? You got to say, you, yeah. you've got to sign up online before you sign up on the app, right? So you got to create your account online before you create the, an account in the app. Is that right? Yeah, you create, exactly. You create your account. You have to, I mean, you have to register that you're a business. Like this is a, this is a sort of legitimate, massive company that like, I mean, AT&T and Verizon and T-Mobile occasionally push an update that causes them to have to push an update to you, how many segments you can send to, how quickly they send the segments, how the segments cost, you know, count as a credit for you with an images versus plain text. It's amazing. Um, yeah. yeah, go online, uh, test it out. I think it's month to month. I hope it is. Mine's 99 bucks for up to a thousand people. I've got a North star of a thousand people on this list. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to show that a thousand people on an SMS list is worth more than a hundred thousand people on an email list. Yeah. I believe it. Mm -hmm. I believe it. Awesome. Thanks. Chris, Angie. thank you Thanks, so much. Thanks, buddy. Awesome. Keep in touch. Today. Thanks, Joe. Have a great day, guys. See you, Taylor. I'm hitting Good up your you, community today. I'm going to be yes. on the community. Keep me posted. All right, Joe. All right, see you, Scott. Thanks, everybody, for watching.